Now I know you're probably thinking, what, another BBC documentary about country music? Okay, Johnny Cash, Dolly Parton, Graham Parsons, blah, 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 no. This is the story of how country music constantly has to reinvent itself to adapt to a changing culture. The reason country music survives is because someone always comes along, takes what's been done before, and adds something original, something unique. This is what it's all about. The musicians who made a difference, who gave us great songs that stand the test of time. You see, people, if you're going to write a hit song, you have to find your target audience. Fortunately, I have found mine. Am I right, ladies? Thanks for coming out tonight. This one's just for you. It's called the Border Collie Song. You ready? Show's up here, ladies. I'm ready to work, I'm ready to work, I'm ready to work, let's go! What's a hold up? I am ready to work, let's go. I am ready to work, I'm ready to herd, I'm ready to go, just say the word. In case you dogs have not heard, I'm a working dog. Now I've got issues, I'll admit. I basically don't know when to quit my one and only occupation. Keep those herds in a tight formation. Missing heifers, wayward strays. Tends to put a damper on my day. It's in my blood. What can I say? I'm a goddamn working dog. Let my boys get out of my way. I'm a goddamn working dog. I've been drinking all day long. Taking in the town. I've done spent my whole paycheck just a honky talking round. I don't have enough to pay my rent. I ain't going to worry though. I got time for one more round and a six pack to go. How can he not afford to pay his rent? The guy's got a hit song on the radio. You see, this is the glaring contradiction in country music. A lot of rich guys and girls singing about how hard their lives are. That's why a lot of people don't like country music. They think it's phony. But here's what you need to understand. Country song is never about the singer. It's about the listener. Because a country song evokes the life of the blue collar worker. You know who I'm talking about. That heavy equipment lifting, Dodge Ram 2500 driving, beer drinking, critter hunting, frustrated with the government, good old boy. Please, please, bartender, I want a six pack to go. I've been a drinking all day long. Country music is a music of working class America. Why? Because it speaks to the heart of rural existence and embraces a simpler life. The good country song is only believable when it's authentic. One six pack to go. Now most folks will tell you that country music's origins consist of ballads and dance tunes with very simple chord structures played mostly by stringed instruments. It's influenced by the Scots, the English, Irish, Scandinavian, and European immigrants who settled in the Appalachian parts of Virginia, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Way down, way down. What you have in the, in the Appalachian South is a mixture of those ballad traditions. You have um, uh, fiddling traditions, uh, you've got the German influence of folks coming to Pennsylvania and then migrating down. You've got African-American influences in the region, and you've got Native American influences. So the culture that was created from this interconnection of a lot of different people created music traditions that are a little bit different from other parts of the country. See, it's way too easy to assume that country music just trickled down from the hills of Virginia or came up from deliverance country. The music that Americans brought over from the old country was incredibly diverse. There were gospel songs and parlor songs and fiddle dance tunes and minstrel songs and even comedy novelty songs. And every one of those styles had many, many variations. Let's just take, for instance, one instrument, the fiddle. Now what is that? Is that a French quadrille? Is that a German waltz? Is that an Irish air? Is that a Scottish reel? 
Why, only an old timer like Ivy could tell you. Fiddle music essentially came from the Shetland Islands or Norway, where even today one in three school children plays one. That music flowed south through the British Isles, crossed the ocean to Newfoundland, and then drifted south through Dixie and into Texas. So it stands to reason there must have been a lot of riverboat workers playing the thing. It was portable and floatable. And at every stop in the rivers, folks picked it up, screeched the bow across the strings, and eventually managed to coax a tune out of it. Fiddling was actually like a regional dialect. Heck, you could tell where people were from by their style of fiddling. That's why Appalachian fiddling is different than Texas double stop fiddling. I'd say you are from about 30 miles north of Nashville. So, with all these fiddle tunes and blues ballads floating around the South, what was needed was someone to record it. A few rudimentary commercial recordings had been made in the early 1900s, but in 1927, a record producer named Ralph Peer arrived in a small town called Bristol on the Tennessee-Virginia border. He set up his equipment, and the songs he recorded became known as the Big Bang of country music. That is the genesis of country music as we know it today. Ralph Peer paid folks $50 a side for their recordings, plus royalties. So at the time, that was unprecedented. Um, it felt very lucrative for the people who came and made records, especially the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers. Jimmy Rogers was known as the singing break man. Ralph Pierce saw the potential in his music and later in 1927 invited him to make further recordings. One of those recordings was called Blue Yodel. And though the word hit wasn't really an applicable term to music in those days, that's exactly what Blue Yodel was. It made Jimmy Rogers the first recognizable country star. Keep on Texas, keep on Tennessee. Texas, Rogers' career was tragically short. In 1933, at the age of 35, he died of respiratory failure. But his legacy and his music would live on, cementing his importance not only to country music, but to the entire American songbook. Now often a song will go through many reincarnations before it finds its uh, perfect musical bed. Now with my song Working Dog, I thought I'd give it the bluegrass spin, because bluegrass is up-tempo and manic, just like a border collie. So I rounded up a handful of the finest bluegrass musicians Nashville has to offer. Is, is this the essence of bluegrass in to play around one mic? So a lot of people do. Yeah. yeah. So. I'll, I'll just play through my crap version of it, and then you guys will make it sound stunning, right? <laughs> so. Okay. I'm ready to work, I'm ready to work, I'm ready to work, let's go! What's the hold up? I am ready to work, I'm ready to hurt, I'm ready to go, just say the word. In case you dogs have not heard, I'm a working dog. If anybody has any arrangement ideas, feel free to throw them in, but that's just, that's the crux of it. You want to do kind of like a swingy type of kickoff thing into it? So let him do that, and then you give me like a, da -da 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 -da. you know, just follow. Is that bluegrass? Bluegrassy. Yes. Does it sound like what you want? Is it encapsulating the thinking of a border collie? This is a manic, a manic hyperactive the, border collie. I guess. They were the same chord structure. So you end up doing something like that. Ready to go, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go. Hey! 
what's the hold up? I am ready to work, I'm ready to hurt, I'm ready to go to say the word. In case you don't have to hurt, I'm a working dog. <laughs> Is that was that good? I think that's we got it, right? The enthusiasm for bluegrass music often seems to rise and fall on the release of southern themed films like Deliverance or the Cohen Brothers Oh Brother Where Art Problem is, this is complete bullshit. Bluegrass music hadn't even been invented in 1937. It didn't come along until the early 40s, when Bill Monroe joined the Grand Ole Opry and needed to create a sound that would make acoustic instruments relevant because electric instruments were starting to take over. Monroe borrowed from the endless catalog of traditional folk and gospel songs, songs about mama and the old country church and the water and hole and the one-room schoolhouse. Stock Americana images, and he ramped them up to 4-4 four -four time with a double-stop fiddle and a tub-thumping bass line. No one called it bluegrass. That term didn't even come in until the 1950s. It was just fast hillbilly music designed to get people at the Grand Ole Opry to tap their feet. So when somebody who's been newly slobbering over bluegrass's balls because they watched a George Clooney film sits down and tries to tell you it's America's truest and purest form of music because it's always played clean and unamplified and sung in a high, lonesome, hog-collar pitched voice, punch that person in the epiglottis and the sound that comes out of their throat will be an authentic hillbilly whine. Mm. One of the strange things about America in the 20s and the 30s was there was complete segregation of schools and churches and restaurants and public transport, but music was the one thing that flowed across cultural lines, because both blacks and whites sang gospel in churches. Are you lonesome tonight? Do you miss me tonight? Are you sorry we visited apart? Some of these songs have become future top 40 hits. Are You Lonesome Tonight, 1960 Elvis Presley hit. Well, Grandma was singing it back in the 20s, sitting on the front porch, playing a little Martin Parlor guitar, drinking mint juleps. But when the mint juleps were done and the moonshine came out, things got a lot darker. There are a lot of different kinds of songs, you know, in these early recordings. And if you, if you really look at the content of them, you can see how People are singing about, you know, things that are important to them or emotional to them or, or, or whatever. But you also see a lot of songs that are about disasters and current events and a lot of songs about betrayal and, uh, yeah, murder ballads. People were fascinated with any song that told a morbid tale, and murder ballads made up a notable portion of traditional music. One of the most famous was made popular by Fiddlin' John Carson. Carson recorded a song called Little Mary Fagan about a girl killed in a pencil factory. The song was based on a sensational murder trial taking place at the time in Georgia, and the convicted killer was a Jewish man named Leo Frank. In the song,
Carson accuses the governor of Georgia of taking a million dollar bribe from a New York bank to have Frank's sentence commuted from life in prison to lynching. So, the governor of Georgia had Carson thrown in jail for slander. Little Mary Fagan, she went to town one day. She went to the pencil factory to get her little pay. She left her home at seven, she kissed her mother goodbye. Not one time did the poor child think that she was going to die. This is the contradictory basis of all country music. Good versus bad, piety versus hedonism, rambling versus home, family versus individuality. He sneaked along behind her till she reached the metal room. He laughed and said, little Mary, you've met your fatal doom. Every country song is a three-minute soap opera. Oh, it might be sweet on the outside, but it's bleeding on the inside. So if you're a country artist and you're trying to put out an album with 12 songs on it in a year, you've got exactly one month to get drunk, depressed, or heartbroken to find your inspiration. Leave me or I'll find someone who will. That's the motto of country music. Oh, you taught me to love him and promise to love and to cherish me over all others above. How my heart is now wondering, no misery can tell. He left me warning, no words of her. After recording for Ralph Peer at the Bristol Sessions in 1927, the Carter family were an instant sensation. They would go on to be the most influential group in country music history. Oh, I long to see him and regret the dark hours, stone and neglected this pale The wholesome crinoline and orchids image of the Carter family belied the darkness of a lot of their music. Wildwood Flower, the most enduring country song ever written, is about waking up to find out you've been dumped. If you know anything about country music, you're aware that the Carter lineage stretches from old AP through Maybell, Sarah, June Carter, Johnny Cash, Nick Lowe, Carlene Carter, more probably being incubated somewhere in Tennessee right now. The Carter family instilled all the virtues on the surface of country music. Purity, decency, domesticity, and most importantly, they projected the idea that country music is a family participation exercise. And like so many musical families that would follow, you know, the Jacksons, the Beach Boys, perceived unity generally hides a nest of domestic abuse. A.P. and Sarah Carter pretended to be married even though they lived separately. A.P. served as a kind of musical director, handpicking the songs, controlling their schedules, often taking credit for composing a song, you know, generally inflating his own sense of self-importance. But the real beauty of the Carters was in their music, their vocals, their singing arrangements. Oh, God, people love to hear about those green hills of Virginia and that little poplar log house and that big home in heaven waiting for them where there was always 50 miles of elbow room. I'm going where there's no depression to the lovely land that's free from care. In the cities of America, the Great Depression had arrived suddenly and devastatingly. Country folks have been living out the Great Depression for the last hundred years. And the music of the Carter family seemed to shield them from the evils of the big bad world. But for a big chunk of their career, the Carters were singing those songs about the green hills of Virginia while actually living in Del Rio, Texas, broadcasting from a seedy border town radio station called XERA. And it was stations like this that played a vital role in bringing country music to a wider audience. The music of Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family, and Bradley Kincaid, country music's pioneers, was very limited and very regional. And it was broadcast over low watt stations throughout the Appalachians. How it earned a wider listenership is a very bizarre story. But here it goes. This guy, J.R. Brinkley, a quack doctor from North Carolina who had been systematically run out of every state he ever attempted to practice in. He'd never earned a medical diploma, never been to medical school, never earned a license to practice. 
He was a snake oil salesman. Brinkley moved to a small town called Milford, Kansas and set up practice with a phony mail order diploma. One day, a patient came in and complained that he was impotent. Brinkley had a great idea. See, he'd been observing these goats and noticed how randy they got when they were mating. He suggested to the patient that if he had a goat's libido, he could drive the ladies wild. For some reason, the patient thought this was a stonking good idea and agreed to have Brinkley insert goat's testicles into his scrotum. Brinkley performed the operation with homemade anesthesia and unsterilized equipment. And sure enough, two weeks later, the guy came back to announce that he was now a bona fide stud. Pretty soon, Brinkley was inserting goat testicles into dozens of patients, claiming that it cured prostate cancer, flatulence, catarrh, headaches, impotence. And to broaden his appeal, he purchased a 50,000-watt radio station, KFKB, and started advertising goat gland treatments on the radio. You men, you're holding back, many of you right now listening to me, and you know you're sick. You know your prostate's infected and diseased. And you know that unless some relief comes to you, that you're going to be in the undertaker's parlor on the old cold slab being embalmed for a funeral. Come at once to the Brinkley hospitals before it's everlastingly too late. In between infomercials, he played country music, both live and recorded. Because of this frankly irresistible mix of country music and goat ball testimony, KFKB soon became the Midwest's most listened to radio station. But then the Kansas State Medical Board decided to investigate Brinkley and soon discovered he wasn't remotely qualified to be a doctor. Then the Federal Radio Commission retracted his license to broadcast. So Brinkley left Kansas and he moved to Del Rio, Texas. Then he bought a 50,000 watt Mexican radio station right across the border in a village called Villa Acuna. And because there were no regulations in Mexico about signal strength, he upped the wattage to one million watts. Then he invited the Carter family down from Virginia and more or less made them the house band. To give you an idea of how powerful a million watts is, birds were flying past the XERA transmission tower and exploding. You didn't need a radio to listen to XERA. You could hear it off an electric fence or the head of a shovel. People were walking around with metal fillings in their teeth, listening to the Carter family sing Wildwood Flower inside their craniums. XERA and its lineup of Texas musicians could be heard throughout a good portion of the United States. And that is how regional country music spread through this great country of ours. True story, hand to God. The sign says welcome to Nashville From whatever road you've been down Nashville, Tennessee. People call it the country music capital of the world. Music City. Home to the Country Music Hall of Fame, Annual Country Music Awards Festival, and of course, the Grand Ole Opry. Where idols and legends have stood the greatest musicians, the greatest producers, the greatest studios, the greatest songwriters are in Nashville, Tennessee, still today. Hollywood, but it's lonely at sundown in Nashville. You can't get away from Nashville and country music. It's not just where the business is, but it's where so many great players are. Each evening at sundown in Nashville, they sweet broken dreams of the street. So how did Nashville become Country Music USA? In 1932, it was just a sleepy southern town with a church on every corner, and its biggest industry was printing Bibles and gospel sheet music. But it did have one thing going for it. It was home to one of the largest radio stations in America, one of the few that could compete with the Border Blaster XERA, WSM, 50,000 watts. A month after it began broadcasting, WSM ripped off a show outright from WLS in Chicago called Barn Dance and aired it live on Saturday nights. If you wanted to hear Patsy Montana, Red Foley, Hank Snow, or Roy Rogers, you tuned into Barn Dance. And the WSM Barn Dance is the main reason that Nashville, not Atlanta, not Bristol, not Shreveport, Nashville became the center of commercial country music in America, especially after the show changed its name to the Grand Ole Opry. 
In 1940, the Opry was the only show in town, and its biggest star was Mr. Roy Acuff. From the great Atlantic Ocean to the wide Pacific shore, from the queen of flowing mountains to the south bells by the shore, Champion fiddler with a big booming voice who would stride out on the Opry stage and sing about the Wabash Cannonball. As she rolled into the station, you could hear all the people say, There's a girl from Tennessee, she's long and she's tall. She came down from Birmingham on the Wabash Cannonball. At this point, there were more songs about trains in America than actual trains. The Wabash Cannonball invoked the Great Depression when destitute men rode the rails. And that mythical cannonball would transport them to the land of milk and honey. Roy Acuff made a fortune singing about poverty, and he was a very astute businessman. I think the beginning of Nashville as a true um, music recording center comes with the establishment of, uh, of Acuff Rose in 1942. Roy Acuff went to Fred Rose and said something to the effect of, I've got some money that I've saved up that I want to invest, I want to start a publishing company, and um, I'd like you to run it. The Acuff Rose partnership reinvented the publishing game. Instead of just selling the sheet music songs were printed on, Acuff and Rose sold the songs themselves. In other words, they copyrighted their own music and chose who they wanted to record it. They set up an office on 8th Avenue South in Nashville. Now one day, Fred and his son Wesley were engaged in a fierce game of ping pong when a gangly, nearsighted man from Montgomery, Alabama walked in. That man's name was Hiram King Williams, or as he called himself, Now, when I was a kid and would hear Hank on the radio, I always thought I was listening to a 60-year-old man singing, because his songs reeked of alienation, drifters, love, the fear of God, and sometimes just good-looking ladies. But he sang hard, pushing the inherent limits of country music as far as... For all the mythology surrounding Hank Williams, one crucial thing is often overlooked. Up to this point, most artists did not write their own songs. They had very little control over what they recorded, pretty much up to the behest of the producers and the publishers, but not Hank Williams. He was a true singer-songwriter. That's why he had a very direct influence on his audiences. It's hard to explain the sway that Hank Williams held over his audience because, you know, the guy didn't sway. He wasn't one of those hip shakers like Elvis who would come along later. He, he just stood there and sang. I try so hard, my dear, to show that you're my Yet Most of his songs were written in perfect meter. In fact, they were so meticulously constructed that when one day out of the blue, he announced he wanted to record a song called Lovesick Blues, Acuff and Rose were thrown for a loop. Lovesick Blues was written by a couple of Tin Pan Alley type songwriters. And um, Hank singing that song is part of his repertoire. And every time he'd do it, the crowd went wild. They, I think they really just loved, you know. I got a feeling called the blues. I got a feeling called the blues. Oh, Lord, since my baby said goodbye. Hank was determined to cut the song because he thought this thing could be tremendous. So they were cutting in Cincinnati. They had about a half an hour to go. And um, Hank says, let's cut that uh, Lovesick Blues thing. And Fred was not interested in it. Fred didn't like the song. Fred said, you know, it's all out of meter. And um, he and Fred really argued over it. He said, I get encore after encore down in um, down at the hayride, they, they love this. Fred finally gave in. 
I think Fred understood either he was going to cut another song on the session or he was going to argue for a half hour with Hank for the rest of the session. Lovesick Blues was the song that made the first country superstar a superstar. I got the Lovesick Blues. See, when it comes to writing a hit song, nobody knows a goddamn thing. Lovesick Blues shot right to number one, catapulted Hank Williams into the superstar strata, and in his short career, he had over 30 hit singles, 11 of which went to number one. More importantly, a lot of them crossed over into other genres when uh, more mainstream artists recorded them. Hey, good looking. What you got cooking? Hey, good looking. About cooking cold, cold heart. Me. Your cheating heart. Jambalaya. All became hits for big time top 40 artists. They were all window dressed and slicker than snot on a doorknob, but they were originally written as a modest country ballad. Now, not every country song can transcend to other genres, but any song can be countryfied. I think it's gonna be a long, long time. Touchdown brings me rabbit came to find. I'm not the man they think I am at home. Oh, no, no, no. I'm a rocket man. The saddest thing about Hank Williams is how his tragic lifestyle always seems to overshadow his incredible contribution to music. He's often cited as the first proto-rocker, because, you know, he was a road warrior and an adulterer and an alcoholic since teenage, and because he suffered from spina bifida, often imbibed in a triple cocktail of morphine, chloral hydrate, and whiskey. He died on New Year's Eve, 1953, at the age of 29, in the back seat of a Cadillac, on the way to a gig in Ohio. On the floor, they found empty liquor bottles and some lyrics to an unfinished song and a strange bruise on his head that no one's ever been able to explain. It was a stupid, mundane way to die, no matter how you try to romanticize it. In fact, in 2016, a British actor by the name of Tom Hiddleston made the disastrous decision to try and portray Hank's life on screen somehow convincing himself that his astute rod of training could capture the essence of a pain-wracked, hard-lived, morally ambiguous Alabama troubadour. Oh, Hiddleston plumbed the depths and nuances of Hank's life in a way not seen since Dick Van Dyke's total immersion into Cockney culture in Mary Poppins. The film was called I Saw the Light, and indeed I did, after five minutes. And the light read, Exit. Killed all the love I ever had. When you're listening to those classic songs of early Nashville, songs like Bye Bye Love by the Everly Brothers or Old oh Pretty Woman by Roy Orbison, chances are it was owned by Roy Acuff and Fred Rose. They were the kingpins of Nashville publishing. And because it always begins with a song, the writers are the true spine of country music. Well, I've been having her for such a long time. Trying to impress her with my hillbilly wine But she told me I was barking up the wrong tree And she liked every kind of music but country In Nashville, songwriting is built around the idea of a hit. You want to have something that is compact, that is very succinct, and that uh, has hooks in it. Nashville songwriting tends to happen in teams. Uh, you really can't get a hit in Nashville anymore unless you've co-written that song with somebody. She said, listening to music was her favorite past coming over, but she told me I was trying to swim upstream. She liked every kind of music but country. How many albums did you make in Nashville? I guess two and a half. And were you pressurized into, like, sitting down with other songwriters? Totally. They introduce you to people that who are strangers, and you sit in a room, and one guy goes, uh, like one of the first guys I got paired up with, took a copy of Time Magazine and the cover said, Flying Blind. He said, that's a good phrase. Let's write Flying Blind today. And uh, how does that relate to a relationship? Okay, she has, uh, she has, uh, she's strayed from the marriage and he, now he's flying blind, but he wants to fly back to the runway where, and you just like build on the, on a metaphor, like a romantic metaphor. And it's, I mean, it's an amusement it, like a crossword puzzle, uh, but, you know, as you can 
probably see from that illustration the the authentic emotion is quickly drained from that exercise as you sit with a stranger and bounce words try, around. Try to come up with a hook. She liked everything about me except for one thing. She liked every kind of music but country. Yeah, she liked everything about me except for one thing. Do you have a dog? Yeah. What kind? Uh, it's a pit bull. Okay, this is not a song about a pit bull. It's a song about the border collie. Fuck you poodles, toys and schnauzers. Around these parts I wear the trousers. You wanna fight me, get in line, I'd kick your butt. But I ain't got time, go fetch a stick and lick your balls. I bet you squat to pay because you don't know what it's like. It ought to be a goddamn working dog. Off my porch, get out of my way. I'm a goddamn working dog. That comes from experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of giving it to Ray Wiley Hubbard. I think he would record it. I think, uh, I think you would have to throw some dirtier words into it than simply fuck. But yes, I think oh. Ray would be interested in that. And then there's, uh, uh, what's her name? Taylor Swift. I, no, I no, can hear. No, 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 I'm thinking of country artists. Oh, God. Country, you should have said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, damn, working dog. Crazy. Everything is cyclical has become a common refrain, especially when referring to artists who believe in the traditions of country music. Country music always wears its influences on its sleeve, and it, it doesn't try to hide it. When someone says, ooh, that gal, that guy is an original, they probably haven't looked hard enough. What a country artist does is finds a wellspring and diverts it to his own backyard. Hank Williams walked into that ping pong match and he demanded that Roy Acuff listen to his music because Roy Acuff was his childhood hero. He had the Roy Acuff syndrome. And Roy was flattered and offered to record Hank Williams. And then Hank took what Roy did and took it further. He sang harder and he partied more darkly. Now, somewhere that lineage is expanding. A place called Littlefield, Texas. A contemporary of the great Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, high school dropout, part-time juvenile delinquent, is succumbing to the Hank Williams syndrome. You see how all this links together? Somebody told me when I first got to Nashville, oh, she finally got it made. Old Hank made it here. Now we're all sure that you win, but I don't think Hank done it this way. I don't think Hank done it this way. Waylon was always going to have a major influence on country music. He had the demeanor, he had the authenticity. And as a kid, he used to sneak into a black blues joint in Littlefield called Jaybird's Do Drop In. The man who called himself Chuck Berry Jr., who wasn't Chuck Berry, taught Waylon how to play lovesick blues, but with the emphasis on the blues part. He told Waylon to replace the top E string of his guitar with a banjo string to bend it easier, and to shave down the frets on his guitar to get a lower action. And that is where Waylon got his unique sound from. Once he discovered the wonders of a phase shifter and a drummer who played slightly behind the beat, his style became even more pronounced. But his lifestyle was channeling Hank right down to the drug addiction and the lonesome, ornery, and mean persona. I've always been crazy in the trouble that it's put me through. I've been busted for things. So, this lineage of influence just continues. For instance, today a lot of people might say that a feller named uh, Sturgill Simpson is a Wayland doppelganger. Sturgill has a very literate style, and damn if he doesn't have that Waylon timber in his voice. But he's not Waylon. He just sounds a bit like him. In country music, a little bit of connectivity goes a long way. The secret is to replicate, not regurgitate. 
Hey, I'm not going to lie to you folks, there's a heck of a lot of regurgitation going on in Nashville right now. This town goes through phases of creativity and stagnation, and right now, woo, it's stinking. A lot of fake hillbillies singing about what they think country people want to hear about. But it can buy me a boat. It can buy me a truck to pull it. It can buy me a Yeti 110 ice down with some silver bullets. Yeah. Pretty much the inspiration for any modern country song could be found at your average dry goods store. Come on, pick a row. Any row. You turn me on, girl, you know you do. But you tear me up, even better in the I ain't cut out to climb highline poles, but I'm pretty good at drinking beer. Just look for the girl in the blue bandana. A lot of the songs I hear on the radio, whether it's Texas or Nashville today, I can't tell what artist it is. When we were coming up, if Waylon came on the radio, you didn't have to wait for the DJ to say, oh, that was Waylon Jennings. You knew it was a Waylon song. But nowadays, to me, the production is just so middle of the road safe that you can't always tell. Hey, get a rhythm. When you get the blues, come on, get a rhythm. When you get the blues. The current creative deficit in Nashville is nothing new. Back in 1964, it was Johnny Cash and Buck Owens keeping this town alive. That was it. There were no new Brenda Lees or Elvis Presleys or Everly Brothers coming along. And worse, the Beatles had invaded. Yeah, the Beatles. Probably imagine Nashville would consider four floppy-haired liver puddlians singing homilytic triads of yeah, 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 as to be a bit of a joke. But by the end of the year, when the Beatles had nine of the top 100 songs in America, Nashville knew they needed someone to match the Beatles in terms of musical articulation. And that man, of course, was Roger Miller. Well, that boy, girl, that a way to make me cry. That a boy, boy, you make me wish I could die. Roger Miller had been hanging around Nashville as a songwriter for years. He scored some modest hits for Jim Reeves and Ray Price, and he had a reputation in Nashville as a brilliant lyricist. Often songwriters would be in a bind, and they would call up old Roger, and he would quote him a killer lyric right on the spot. All you do is make me sit out feeling blue. Atta boy, girl, out a way to hurt my pride. The only thing was, he had no real passion for country music. He wanted to move to California and be an actor. He had a small recording contract with Mercury Records, and he asked for an advance of $1,600 so he could move to Los Angeles. The head of Mercury said, yeah, I'll give you the money if you'll give me 16 songs. So Miller went into a studio and cranked out 16 songs that were primarily syncopated gibberish. Titles like chug a lug do whack a doo and Dang Me. Dang me, dang me, they ought to take a rope and hang me, high from the highest tree. Woman, would you weep for me? Dang Me shot the number one on the charts and stayed there for six weeks. Later on, Chug a Lug became a massive hit. Not just on the country charts, on the pop charts as well. But on a double backflip, Chug a Lug, Chug a Lug. Make you wanna holler, holly ho. Burn your tummy, don't you know? Chug a Lug, Chug a Lug, Chug a Lug, Chug a Lug. See, one man had made Nashville relevant again. And just to prove that he wasn't just a series of doo wack doos and dippa dippa doo doos a year later, he recorded the greatest drunk-proof karaoke song ever, King of the Road, a song that anyone can sing no matter how smashed they are. That was the genius of Roger Miller. Look, I don't want to get pedantic or anything, but the essence of any great country song is always the lyrics. There has to be a narrative, something that explores the, I don't know, the fragility of life, 
family relationships, the fact that there's no easy solution to the contradictions of life, rural values, or dogs. When country music gets away from that essence, those core values, it sucks. Roger Miller's lyrics were basically sending up the banality of country music at the time, but he wasn't a novelty act. He'd written great songs, brilliant songs, songs like Husbands and Wives or It Only Hurts When I Cry, and he knew a good song when he heard one, which is why in 1969, he recorded a song by a young songwriter named Chris Christopherson, who was hanging out here at the Exit Inn on Elliston Place. He'd only just arrived in Nashville, and he'd written a song called Me and Bobby McGee. Christopherson was one of those prodigal golden children who always seem to show up in Nashville when they need him the most. Bobby shared the secrets of my soul. When Johnny Cash recorded Christopherson's Sunday Morning Coming Down, it immediately went to number one. And when he started telling anyone who would listen that Chris Christopherson and Mickey Newberry were the two hot new songwriters in town, then Chris Christopherson was anointed. Do you understand? Patronage is a very, very important part of country music's endurance. People support each other. You don't get those knockdown, drag out feuds that always involve Taylor Swift and Kanye West, or Taylor Swift and Nicki Minaj, or Taylor Swift and every boyfriend who's ever dumped her. The point I'm making is that nowhere by any stretch of the imagination, in any realm, in this or any other universe, is Taylor Swift a country artist. There's a road in Oklahoma. Christopherson and a group of friends, Willie Nelson, Waylon, Jesse Coulter, Tom Paul Glazer, and Billy Joe Shaver, had taken to viewing themselves as rebels within Nashville's music community. By rebels, I mean that their stuff wasn't exactly flying out of the record bins, but they'd cultivated an outlaw image, and that brought in a whole new fan base made up of some of the more marginalized members of society. I push that low. The outlaw image was poles apart from that Carter family wholesome country music. It was a reaction to the slick Nashville sound, but the irony was that Nashville itself was about to cash in on the movement. The head of RCA Nashville, Jerry Bradley, was about to get shit canned. He wasn't selling any country albums. But he did own a back catalog of Willie, Waylon, Jesse, and Tom Paul material. So he thumbed through a Time Life book on the Old West and found a wanted poster. Took it into RCA's design department and said, hey, let's put Willie and Waylon on a wanted poster. Then he chucked on 11 songs that he just kind of had laying around. The album had all the production values of a blown speaker in the back of a Mexican Chevy. But wouldn't you know, it would become the biggest selling album in the history of country music. Mama, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. Don't let them pick guitars and drive them old trucks. Make them be doctors and lawyers and such. That album and its follow-up, which featured Willie and Waylon singing Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Cowboys, created a new legion of country converts. Be mom with someone they love. Never mind that this scheme was cooked up by RCA, pretty much the quintessential embodiment of corporate thinking, didn't matter. These guys were selling records, so they played up the image to the hilt. There's still no one that I'd rather introduce than my musical comrades. Chris Christopherson, Waylon Jennings, and a baby-faced kid from Texas named Willie Nelson. They call us the Highwaymen. I was a highwayman along the coach roads I did ride. Sword and pistol by my side. The distinction of original bad boy, of course, belongs to Johnny Cash, who would team up with Willie, Waylon, and Chris to form the Highwaymen, a country supergroup that took the outlaw motif to its natural conclusion. Now, Cash didn't actively promote a bad boy image, but neither did he try to deny it. There were rumors he'd been in prison. Not true. The only brushes he'd ever had with the law was when his Winnebago somehow accidentally set a campground on fire, and once for possession of painkillers. But to America, 
he was the man in black. Again, not to evince an aura of badassness, he just wanted to dress like one of his heroes, the human rights activist and calypso singer, Harry Belafonte. Perhaps I may become a highway medicine. Or I may simply be a single drop of rain. But I will remain. And I'll be back again and again. In the homogenized world of country music, Johnny Cash will always stand alone. He sang in that deep baritone. He uh, married into a pedigreed family. He's revered in folk circles as much as the Nashville scene. In fact, people who hate country music love Johnny Cash. Love him. And Dolly Parton. People would love country music a lot more if it would maintain some kind of constant standard, but it never does. In the 1980s, one man single-handedly reduced country music to a bovine cesspool of boot-scooting, line-dancing vulgaria. That man's name was John Travolta. Hey, bud. How you doing? Fine. Anything I can do for you? Not yet. Can <laughs> you be a cowboy? Well, it depends on what you think a real cowboy is. The movie Urban Cowboy came along and just really screwed it up. Because then it wasn't about the music, it was about mechanical bulls, you know, like a country disco. Yeah. You know, line dancing and, and all that. It just, uh, it just, it kind of ruined it, I thought. Country music had become a backing track for scores of big haired secretaries and weekend Wyatt Earps to join together in a drunken lockstep and slip and slide through puddles of margarita while Johnny Lee sang. I was looking for love in all the wrong places Looking for love in too many places Nashville desperately needed to get back to its roots. Ricky Skaggs, a musical prodigy with the fingers of Bill Monroe and the head of Conway Twitty, believed that country music needed to pay more attention to its elders, to dance with the one that brung you, so to speak. For these Holly 40 blues I've walked hold of both my shoes Kind of the day since I've been gone And I'd love to see the lights of home There was a combination of vintage stylings, carefully crafted vocals, and most importantly, superb musicianship. The country acts who followed in the late 80s. Vince Gill, Randy Travis, George Strait were a new generation of musicians who had grown up in the age of rock and roll. They didn't strum guitars, they played the everlasting shit out of them. If you put in the time in the shoe leather, eventually you may find yourself on stage with Albert Lee, one of the greatest country guitarists ever, who just happens to be English. At that point, you've been benighted. If there's one certainty in this world, it's that Nashville will always survive. It has a formula, and it sticks to it. But... The best country music hasn't been coming from Nashville. It's been coming from a place 850 miles west of Nashville. Screw you, we're from Texas. Screw you, we're from Texas. Austin, Texas calls itself the live music capital of the world. And since the 1970s, it's really become an alternative to Nashville. We're from Texas. We're from Texas. Ah, screw you. We tend to think of Nashville songwriters as being craftsmen, and we tend to think of Texas songwriters as being poets. Now don't get me wrong, I love the USA and the other states. Yeah, they're okay. Texas is very much a, a conservative state, but Austin is very much a liberal bastion. We got Willie and Jack and Jack and Robert Earl, got Hayes, Carl, Slate, Cleese, and a whole lot more, so screw you. Austin is really probably a more important music town than Nashville Texas. now. Screw you, we're from Texas. We're from Texas. Ah, screw you. What does a town need to become musically vital? It needs a lot of competing styles, that's what. And in and around Austin in the 1960s, you could hear folk, honky-tonk, bluegrass, Cajun, Zydeco, Tejano, and even some rockin' German umpa. If that sounds like an impossible stew of cacophony, it is. 
One of the great things about being a Texas songwriter is that you have the wellspring of Texas tradition to draw from always, right? And so if things seem to get to be a little too commercial or a little too out of touch with reality, you can always go back and dig into cowboy songs or the cowboy mythology or, you know, go back to the blues roots to reinvent your work or to reinvent the music that's coming out of that community. The whole thing about the Texas thing is there's this whole independent history of Texas, you know, being very independent, don't tell us what to do. You know, like we didn't have to depend on a record label saying, yes, we'll give you a deal and here's the money. You just did it. And that's the great thing about uh, a lot of the songwriters and musicians that come down here. They, they have this incredible freedom to, 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 to write. I've know? written a song for you. Okay. You don't hear it? Yeah. yeah. All right. I, I, you're going to like this. You're going to want to record this. Okay. All right. It's called the Border Collie Song. It's a good title. I'm ready to work, I'm ready to work, I'm ready to work, let's go! What's the hold up? I am ready to work, I'm ready to herd, I'm ready to go. Just say the word in case you dogs have not heard, I'm a goddamn working dog. <laughs> Working dog, you son of a bitch. I take my bath in a drainage ditch. Wait one second, let me scratch this itch. I'm back. yippee ki yo yippee ki yay I can do this all damn day. Get off my porch, get out of my way. I'm a goddamn working dog. Off my porch, get out of my way. I'm a goddamn working dog. I like it. <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> Texas has always been an incredibly conservative state. It's Republican ground zero, but Austin has two things going for it. It's the state capital, and it's home to the University of Texas. So if there was ever gonna be any semblance of progressive thinking in the Lone Star State, it was gonna be in Austin. Every time there's a new generation of young people coming to town, there's a new musical revolution. There's always something new, something fresh. And this is the reason Austin was able to develop a music scene that was different to Nashville. In the late 60s, it was attracting hippies, activists, baby boomers, people looking for an artistic oasis. They had to build their own scene in Austin so that they could have long hair and smoke a little marijuana and listen to the music that they cared about and still be safe doing it. Now, in the early 60s, uh, listening to counterculture music in Texas consisted of coming down here, tapping your penny loafers to a sizzling hot folk trio at Threadgill's. In 1933, this place had been a gas station, and a fellow named Kenneth Threadgill worked there. He pumped enough gas to eventually buy the joint and turn it into a hootenanny tavern. After World War II, he started running open mic nights, basically so he could get up and yodel with the musicians. There was no stage. The musicians just sat amongst each other and played. And then old Kenny would wander over and start yodeling. This literally was the beginning of the Austin scene. A little dive bar kind of out on the outskirts of town. It had been open since the 30s. It was the first place to get a beer license uh, after Prohibition. And they had these things, they called them hoot, hoot nannies. Uh, they would sing folk songs and, and uh, you know, drink cheap beer and eat cheap hamburgers and have a nice time uh, a couple of days a week. Uh, and you had people who were, you know, aspiring folk singers, people who were interested in Jimmy Rogers songs, you know, going all the way back to the beginnings of country music, and uh, people who were interested in the blues. But all these styles emphasized a point. This was music about Lone Star heritage, played by Texans for Texans. In the mid-1960s, two musicians from a band called Hoot Nanny Hoots were on their way here to perform. They picked up a scruffy hitchhiker along the way, and she accompanied them to Threadgills. Notably, as so many hitchhikers did at the time, she was carrying an auto harp. Don't you know that you're nothing more than a one-night stay? She was a University of Texas student with a relaxed approach to personal hygiene and a fondness for pearl beer. At UT, she had actually been voted ugliest man on campus. Her name was Janis Joplin. Wednesday night at Threadgills, and that's where everybody heard Janis Joplin sing in public regularly for the first time. And that was and, right here. And that was, that was right here in this little space. Don't you know? 
Soon people were packing Threadgill's on a Wednesday night to watch Janice perform. She would, of course, go on to become the preeminent blues rock singer of the 60s, queen of the West Coast psychedelic movement, and when she OD'd in 1970, kind of a poster child for rock and roll excess. She's not really associated with the Texas music scene, but that was the thing about Kenny Threadgill. He would let anybody who wanted to perform. The general consensus is that her excessive lifestyle is what led to Janice's demise, but actually that is not true. Her autopsy confirmed that so many little pieces of her heart had been taken that she could no longer function. Tragic. Just tragic. This was the crazy thing about the emerging Austin scene. There was such an eclectic mix of people and music, no one could quite define what it was. In the late 60s, Texas music had a problem, converting rednecks into hippies. See, rock and psychedelia was sweeping the coast, but Texas was resistant, and the Threadgill's vibe needed a bigger format, a place to expand. This place would be the Armadillo World Headquarters. Struggling promoter Eddie Wilson opened its doors in 1973 to anyone who wanted good music and cheap beer. Our job was to find a place to play so that we could have a payday every now and then. And I had discovered a huge empty building. It looked like a National Guard armory. We set out to try to fill it up. And it stayed empty most of the time for the first couple of years. It was lonely and miserable, and we felt sorry. For, I felt sorry for myself. But then gradually, people heard about it, and then they sought it out. Now, were you a fan of music at this time? Did you know what you were doing? Did you know who you were booking? Could anybody play I didn't know anything at all about the contemporary music scene. It was an education by submersion. Right. And uh, luckily, I came up before I drowned. The doorman wakes at you on your way out. Oh, it's deep inside. The Armadillo World Headquarters would have a huge effect on Texas music. It was a venue where the world of the hippie and the world of the redneck collided, for better or worse. And the artists who were looking for an alternative to Nashville started drifting there. One singer-songwriter, forever associated with this town, would write a song that somehow brought it all together. In 1972, a Dallas-born musician named Michael Martin Murphy sat on a rooftop in New York City and composed the song Cosmic Cowboy. When I left Los Angeles, uh, I had been through a lot of, a lot. And I said, burial grounds and merry-go-rounds are all the same to me. I'd been living close to Disneyland, and a lot of my friends were dying uh, from drugs. So burial grounds and merry-go-rounds are all the same to me. Horses on posts and kids and ghosts are spirits they ought to set free. Now he was homesick for Texas, he was clearly fed up with the music recording business, and he was probably stoned. But the song envisions a mythical place where a musician can thrive free of competition and creative restraints, you know, a place where he can ride and rope and hoot. I just want to be a cosmic cowboy. My second album was based on trying to describe this movement that was beginning to come together. Jerry Jeff Walker, Chris Christopherson. We had a cosmic perspective, and it was very poetic. So that's why I call them the Cosmic Cowboys. had cosmic cowboy hippie thing going on and then the country thing and when they kind of mesh you had kind of these long haired you know dope smoking hippies wearing cowboy hats and, and, and cowboy boots you know and uh, that was very cool.
Now, Murphy had grown up on cowboy songs, so he was very enamored with the imagery of the Southwest, and he worked it into a modern scenario, that of a frustrated musician going back to a, an earlier time in a simpler place. He invoked a lot of very specific Austin references, like uh, Hippie Hollow, which was a local skinny dipping spot, or Lone Star Beer, Armadillo World Headquarters. In other words, he made Austin both specific and mythical. And he recorded the song with a very imprecise, spontaneous background that kind of rejected the Nashville slick style sound. It wasn't Murphy's intention to galvanize a subculture, but that's kind of what happened. Now, if you were a Baptist-raised, backsliding Texan who'd somehow succumbed to the wiles of grade-A Michoacan weed, you had a name to call yourself, Cosmic Cowboy. Murphy struck a blow of independence for all those songwriters looking to avoid Nashville, and scores of Texas-born musicians took up the mantle. Guys like B.W. Stevenson and Jerry Jeff Walker showed up from California. Others, like Gary P. Nunn's Lost Gonzo Band, had never left Texas. The underlying theme of so much of this early Austin music was, was homesickness and, and wistfulness and, and escape. Even if you'd never been to Texas, guys like Michael Martin Murphy and Gary P. Nunn made you feel like you were missing out on something if you weren't here. They were creating a shit-kicking, freewheeling oasis in a sea of Richard Nixon conservatism. You only had to go up north to Oklahoma to realize that country music was still the domain of conservatives. One of the most popular songs at the time was Okie from Muskogee by Merle Haggard. Leather boots are still in style for manly footwear. Beads and Roman sandals won't be seen. Football's still the roughest thing on campus. And the kick dance still respects the college dean. And I'm proud to be an Okie. Nixon's America really cottoned on to Oki from Muskogee. It was a backlash to all those commie pinko hippies protesting the Vietnam War. But there's always been speculation that Haggard wrote the song as a joke, an accusation he's chosen not to clarify when interviewed. You didn't have any tremendous inspiration or motivation behind writing that song at the time? No. Of course, you know it was controversial at the time. Uh, and some people probably still hold it against you. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, Maybe they do, and I'll argue the point with them. You know, I, I think that there was what they were actually, uh, the, m the main bitch during the time in which uh, Okie and Muskogee came, came out was the right to do whatever the hell you wanted to do. And I, could, I jumped out there and did it, and they jumped on me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> think about that a minute. Whether Haggard meant it as a joke or not, a few years later, Ray Wiley Hubbard answered the song with Up Against the Wall, Redneck Mother, a satire about rednecks who enjoy inflicting copious amounts of whoop-ass on peace-loving hippies. He was born Oklahoma. The song was alternately performed by Hubbard and another influential Texas songwriter, Jerry Jeff Walker. It's up against the wall, redneck mother. In August of 1973, Walker recorded his Viva Terlingua album entirely in this small Texas hill town with intermittent electricity called Luckenbach. He wanted to reject the formal approach to make an album, so he invited a lot of musical friends, and they showed up with some half-thought-out ideas and rough musical sketches and about 18,000 gallons of sangria. To me, like I say, that Viva Terlingua album is still like the definitive progressive country album. Did you record on that? Uh, no, I didn't. I got lost. <laughs> I couldn't get down to Lukenbach that day. But they called me up, and Bob <laughs> called me up and said, Hey, man, Jerry Jeff down here cutting this album, and we want to do the, the song Up Against the Wall, Redneck Mother. And I go, you got to be kidding me. And he goes, No, they want to do it. 
And he said, but we need a second verse. So I said, well, he sure likes to drink Falstaff beer. <laughs> so I wrote the second verse over the phone with kind of what I was, he likes to drink it with wild turkey liquor. He just kind of looked around and saw what was around me at the time. Sure does like to drink his old Dos Equis beer. Chasing down that old wild turkey bourbon liquor. Go, 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 go. It was progressive what they were doing because nobody was really doing that. I mean, Jerry Jeff had kind of really meshed that country rock and roll. You know, it wasn't just like country rock. It was rock and roll guys, you know, showing up and just destroying the stage and leaving and just, you know, going crazy. And it was just an incredible band. So are these 34 drinking in the honky tonk? Call it cosmic cowboy music or gonzo music or armadillo music. This this emerging sound was like a, a musical travel brochure for the state of Texas, you know, full of specific references and place names and incestuous name dropping. It was kind of a spontaneous approach to recording. Now, Viva Terlingua wasn't some kind of defiant, self-produced indie record. Uh, much like the Outlaws album, it was actually financed by a large record company, MCA. But they went along with Jerry Jeff's crazy, crazy idea, and uh, it was a success in the sense that it was critically well-received, all the musicians made a bit of money off of it, and it took a place no one had ever heard of and turned it into a household name. In 1977, nearly four years after Jerry Jeff's Viva Terlingua album, old Waylon Jennings had a hit with his own Lukenbach-inspired song. Let's go to Lukenbach, Texas, with Waylon and Willie and the boys. Did Waylon move to Lukenbach? No. Guy never even set foot in the place. But Viva Terlingua struck a balance between creative freedom and commercial vitality, and it showed that Texas music was about the people, not the studios. I've no regrets about the past. There's nothing I can change. But life's a road. Walk just one way down. So this Texas music scene had clearly taken country music into a new direction, but it still needed something, someone to solidify it, to pull it all together. Texas has always been conservative, but it's also nonconformist. And when these two disciplines meet, something mutant is going to emerge. Let me explain it in terms of tribal electric friction. If the static object is C, conservative Texas, represented by guys with cans of Lone Star beer, Levi's, starched white shirts, and a Protestant upbringing, meets D, the drifting force, incense, tie-dye shirts, and some pot-infused dream of becoming a cowboy, then V is the vector, where these farm boys have moved to Houston or Dallas and somehow think that Smokey and the Bandit, about two idiot rednecks smuggling beer across state lines is the greatest cinematic achievement ever, share a coefficiency with romantic long hairs who want to get back to the land and think that Up in Smoke by Cheech and Chong is the greatest film ever because it's about two idiot hippies smuggling dope across state lines, then the result is an electrostatic charge, which when mixed with a flammable vapor like alcohol or marijuana produces a gaseous cloud called Willie Nelson. On the road again. I just can't wait to get on the road again. The life I love is making music with my friends. And I can't wait to get on the road again. What Willie did, it was his real genius, was that he got the rednecks and the really conservative people together with the really liberal people in the hippie generation, and they all got along. And he put on these events where everybody was there. So Willie may not have been to Austin first, but he picked up the football and ran <laughs> when the ball was fumbled many times. Back in Nashville in 1971, Willie was drowning in molasses. This was a guy who'd written crazy for Patsy Cline. He'd written funny how time slips away, nightlife, tunes that would be standards in anyone's American songbook. But Nashville was killing Willie Nelson. Every one of his albums would have two or three self-pinned diamonds and then a whole lot of crap. Then one day, thankfully, his house caught fire. The story goes that he ran inside to salvage a pound of Colombian as the house was burning instructed his nephew to park a beat-up old car in the garage so he could claim it on insurance, and then headed to Bandera, Texas. 
When he re-emerged, the old sport coat and turtleneck Willie had been replaced. He had hippie hair. He wore a Native American bandana, Jesus sandals, and earrings. This guy was appropriating so many conflicting cultures, no one knew what to make of him. And they didn't care, because nobody on the planet doesn't love Willie Nelson. He's on the road again. I just can't wait to get on the road again. The new Texas music up to this point was basically a celebration of arrested adolescence. Willie made it about arrested behavior of an indeterminate age because nobody knows how old Willie Nelson is. He might be 65, he might be 103. In 1973, he organized the first Willie Nelson 4th of July picnic in Dripping Springs. Anyone with a beard and a small kitten was admitted for free. The annual 4th of July picnics have become a staple of Texas music, and over the years, every kind of country musician has played there. Which makes the event inclusionary. I think I just made that word up. So many of the performers are from Texas, but because the event is held in Texas and it celebrates Texas, it's exclusionary. To mainstream country music, that is. You know, Nashville. Now grab your partner and pat her on the head. She don't like biscuits, feed her cornbread. Gals around Austin, about half grown. A jump on a man like a dog on a bone. You gotta stay all night, stay a little longer, dance all night. Dance a little longer, pull off your coat. Throw it in the corner, don't see why you don't stay a little longer. Willie Nelson is the absolute embodiment of Texas music. He's got one of the greatest voices of all time and that unmistakable quicksilver style of singing where he hangs behind the beat and then slips right into place like your grandmother's favorite slipper. But he's more than just a musician, he's his own lifestyle. From the moment he emerges from a cloud-filled bus, bandana intact, guitar perforated, to the end of a raucous show that invariably has the crowd doing his backing vocals, Willie exudes a communal vibe. Not many musicians can get 10,000 people to show up and help pay his back taxes. And when farmers are going broke and transatlantic pipelines need to be stopped, towns are blown up in fertilizer explosions, or schools for impaired children need to be built, Willie shows up does the show for free, for three hours. Everyone has a good time, and somewhere, Bono squirms just a little bit on that self-righteous cross he's nailed himself to. Now, the other half of the term country and western is western. And you can't talk about Texas music without mentioning western swing. It's a form of country music that dates back to the early 20s. During the 70s, while all those cosmic cowboys were doing their thing, Ray Benson and Asleep at the Wheel were boogieing toward Texas from Pennsylvania. They wanted to remind the world that Texans had been rocking long before those armadillos invaded. In Western swing music, we hear the blues, we hear big band arranging like Count Basie style stuff, and we hear the influence of that Czech polka. And so, uh, musically speaking, that's where Western swing comes from. Western swing music is challenging music. You gotta have half a foot in country music and a half a foot in jazz. Right. Can you show it on the guitar so you the difference between a country progression like, you know, Yeah, here, hand me that blind guitar and, there on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, well, there's no difference. It's the way it's played. So you take uh, take a song like You're Cheating Hard. Everybody knows You're Cheating Hard. You're cheating hard, we'll make you leave. You'll cry and cry and try to sleep. Well, the Western Swing would be. You're cheating hard, we'll make you leave. And heck, well, it's had a lot of Western Swing in them, but it will and try to. As opposed to. So those are different substitute chords, they call them, but it's jazz, swing. The king of Western swing, Bob Wills, was really a band leader. 
Sometimes he sang, sometimes he played the fiddle. Often he threw solos to the piano player, the guitarist, the steel guitar player, or a guest vocalist, all the while keeping the whole musical thing afloat. Well, it's all a summer, all a fall, trying to find my little all in all. But Texas swing has an unmistakable feel to it. 4-4, four, four, brush drums, walking bass, double stop fiddle. There's nothing else quite as infectious. Bob considered himself a big band like the Dorsey band, like the Miller band, but with fiddles, steel guitar, and guitar. Um, but he was a band leader in that ilk, and then you hired vocalists. He patterned himself after the big bands, but he was unique in that he was a Western big band. Yeah. Bob was outrageous. Bob was like the Mick Jagger of his time. Uh, he pranced around on stage like a peacock. He was nuts. He was jumping around, hollering like this, going like this, and pointing out. And he never did anything the same twice. So deep in love with you. Well, I couldn't leave Austin without channeling the spirit of Bob Wills. So with Ray Benson and Asleep at the Wheel, I decided to give the old working dog a western swing workout. All I would say as musicians is don't think as musicians, think as a border collie. Right. If we all get on that border collie page, then the, the, the feel will come. Do we have to do the thing where they sniff the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Get over here. <laughs> tempo. Fast, fast. So it's a really hyperactive dog. Let's go. All right. We got shit to do. Hey, you can have this song. I'm giving this song to you. It's a good one. Okay, play it and play along, see if you can, if we're in. So it's like a diminished, but not. I'm ready to work, I'm ready to work, I'm ready to work. Let's go! What's a hold up? I am ready to work, I'm ready to herd, I'm ready to go. Just say the word in case you dogs have not heard of a goddamn word and no. Issues, I'll admit, I basically don't know when to quit my one and only occupation. Keep those herds in a tight formation, missing heifers, wayward strays. Tend to put a damper on my day. It's in my blood, what can I say? I'm a goddamn working dog. Get off my porch, get out of my way. I'm a goddamn working dog. <laughs> Excellent! Thank you! <laughs> Asleep at the wheel are constantly evolving, which is exactly what country music needs to do. Because right now, Austin is in some kind of tertiary stage where the city is moving too fast, but the music is moving too slow. It's looking a little ragged. You know, all those little musical roads that led to Austin? They're now digital corridors. The South by Southwest Festival started out as a country music festival. Now it's just full of digital hipsters begging for startup money. The rents are sky high. This is Sixth Street. This was supposed to be Austin's answer to Broadway in Nashville. I don't mind telling you, folks. It's a little bit shit. Maybe a certain Texan by the name of Don Henley said it best when he said, call something paradise, kiss it goodbye. Whether your country music comes from Texas or Tennessee, one thing is for certain. A good country song will always stand the test of time. Play, sing, or recite. A lyric that just that you think is one of the greatest country lyric songs. Oh, gosh. Song lyric. <laughs> Hang on one second. No question. I know exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, you want to be... I don't want it to be mine. It's not mine anyway. 
I'm a rolling stone All alone and lost For a life of sin I paid the cost When I walk by All the people say There's another guy On the lost highway Hank Williams and Fred Rose. Yep. <laughs> I took her down, both her and David. I said, I'm going to see you in your grave. They laughed at me until I shot them. And put their cheating, scheming bones in Miller's cave. So I love that whole song, but that verse but they laughed at me until I shot them. I like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> to me, um, one of the best written songs I've ever heard was I Want to Talk About Me. I want to talk about me, I want to talk about I, I want to talk about number one, oh my, oh my, what I think, what I want, what I want, what I want, what I want. I love talking about you, 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 usually, but occasionally I want to talk about me. I think that's ab ab absolutely brilliant. Strap them kids and give them a little bit of vodka and a chair of coke. We're going to Oklahoma. Yeah, that's probably, that's what I'm, and there's a lot of my favorite lyrics, but that just kind of comes right off the bat, you know. Of one oh, of them. Yeah. <laughs> Willie Nelson, uh, I want to get, I'm going to get drunk and I sure do dread it because I know just what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend my money calling everybody honey and wind up singing the blues. Spend my whole paycheck on some old wreck. Brother, I can name you a few. Well, I'm going to get drunk and I sure do dread it because I know just what I'm going to do. Which is my first musical memory. I can remember hearing that on an eight track tape that my dad had. And like that for me, that's country music as far as it goes. Yeah, the Dublin Blues by uh, Guy Clark. Oh, okay. I think I know this. Well, I wish I was in Austin. Uh huh. At the Chili Parlor Bar, drinking Mad Dog margaritas and not caring where you are. But here I am in Dublin, rolling cigarettes, and holding back and choking back the shakes with every breath. So forgive me all my anger, forgive me all my faults. There's no need to forgive me for thinking what I thought. I loved you from the get-go, I loved you till I died. I loved you on the Spanish steps the day you said goodbye. Now that song talks about relationships, but it talks about Dublin, about Italy. <laughs> And yet it's as country as can be, but it's as sophisticated as can be. Guy Clark, the greatest. I'll be honest with you, folks. I can't cover country music in 90 minutes. It's not enough time. I'm sure you've been watching thinking, well, where's Dolly Parton? Hey, trust me, Dolly Parton gets plenty of oxygen. I've been trying to convince you that true country music values its roots and its traditions. Nobody writing country songs nowadays picked cotton or worked on a railroad. Used to be the lifestyle created the music, now the music creates the lifestyle. But the good stuff stands the test of time. It's authentic. You know it when you hear it. As for Working Dog, my CD, come on, I'm not gonna get a cut. Who am I fooling? But I'll tell you this, I'm not a fan of the term bucket list, because that implies that you're trying to backload an otherwise uneventful life. So what? You swam with the dolphins. You saw the northern lights. Who cares? But if someone told me I was going to have the chance to record my song with Ray Benson and Asleep at the Wheel, take me now, Jesus. Now I've got issues, I'll admit. I basically don't know when to quit my one and only occupation. Keep those herbs in a tight formation. Heifer's wayward strays tends to put a damper on my day. It's in my blood. What can I say? I'm a goddamn working dog. 
Less country and more political. Washington, D.C.'s favorite phone in Rich Hall's U.S. breakdown on 60 Days of Trump. Wednesday, 6.30 on Radio 4. Now, the homegrown country band heading for Nashville. BBC4 follows the Shires as they launch their second album next. My boys get out of my way, I'm a goddamn.